My name is Granger, and I am a, a husband of Amber, father of four. London is our oldest. She's going she's gonna to be 12 in October. Uh, Lincoln is nine. Then we lost River when he was three. And then we have our fourth, and he is Maverick, turning two today. It's his birthday today. Yeah. <laughs> I am a member at Emmaus Church in Georgetown, Texas, and I am a touring country music artist. And it, it's interesting I say it that way because this is actually a monumental week for me in my career. Today being Sunday, the first day of what is going to be, Lord willing, the last week of me claiming myself to be a touring musician. I will be hanging it up at, in Billy Bob's, Texas, in Fort Worth, six days from today. And I will no longer be considered a touring musician, something I've been identified as for the last 24 years. Besides my family, it has arguably been the greatest passion of my life until now. And I want to tell you this morning that I have no regrets about this. I have no second thoughts or doubts. It's not even bittersweet. I can't say bittersweet because, in fact, there is no bitterness at all, only, only gratefulness for this journey that God has given me, that God has orchestrated as this beautiful musical score in my life. You know, I'm so thankful for all the years of doing it. There has been, I, I guess, a lot of speculation as to what is the real reason that I'm doing this? A lot of misunderstanding about this big shift in my life. And so this morning, I want to tell you the real reason that I'm leaving touring. I want to set the record straight, as you will. But first, we have to understand exactly what happened to me in this shift of the last five years. And I want to begin with an incredible section of Scripture. And this is so profound that its foundation has literally shaped and reoriented everything in my life over the past five years. And it doesn't only apply to me. It applies to everyone in this room. So what I'm about to read is so rich and nourishing that I had trouble as I was preparing picking a few of the highlighted scriptures here and there, so I decided just to read 17 verses of it. And trust me when I say that I could preach this every single Sunday of the entire year and preach the same 17 verses and still not completely unpack the depth and multiple layers of this scripture. What I'm talking about is Psalm 51, and I would love for you all to look with me we're going to put it on the screen, but I would, I would also encourage you to, to look. If you don't have a Bible with you, I'm reading out of the ESV. So if you, if you just pull out your phone and you Google Psalm 51 ESV, it'll come right up and you could read along. I think it's important that we see it and hear it together, not just taking my word for it. So here we go, Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, 
and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness, O Lord. Open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God. You will not despise. Let's pray. Father, open our hearts and our minds as we hear this scripture inspired by you through your servant, David, whom you said is a man after your own heart. Let us see the wisdom in this. Let us be able to discern your word as we hear it, as it pierces us, as you promised, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing soul and spirit, joint and marrow, doing its work, not from me, not from my story and my personality, but from your word working through me. Let me be your servant this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to ask a question this morning, a question that in my life brought me to an absolute breaking point. It is this. What do you do with overwhelming guilt. I want to break this down in, into two points by asking only two very simple questions. Number one, what does the world say to do with your guilt? And number two, what does the Bible say we could do with our guilt? Psalm 51 was written by David, king of Israel. In about 1,000 B.C., you might remember David as the boy in the story of David and Goliath. He didn't fear any man because he found his strength in the Lord. He killed this giant Philistine warrior with a sling and a stone, becoming an instant legend in Israel, an eventual king. And by the time we hear from David in Psalm 51, he's no longer a shepherd boy, He's now a grown man, and his riches are unmatched in the world. And so is his power and his fame and his comfort. One day in his palace, he saw a woman named Bathsheba bathing on a distant rooftop, and he was captivated by her beauty. He found out that she was the wife of Uriah, a faithful warrior fighting in David's army. Despite knowing this, he sends for Bathsheba, took her into his palace, and raped her. But it gets worse. She got pregnant. He tries to cover up his shame by calling Uriah back home from the battlefield to sleep with his wife to make it look like he was the father of the child. But Uriah was a man of integrity a man of loyalty. He refused to come back to his wife while his friends were still fighting in the battle. So David goes to plan B. He orders Uriah to be moved to the front lines of the battle where he will surely die, and he does. David marries Bathsheba. Problem is solved for a while until God sends his prophet, Nathan, to David to speak for God, to tell him, I know what you did, and I'm not happy. David is guilty of lust, rape, of murder, and all sin, all sin is a sin against God himself. It's, it's like a breach of a relationship. David breached the relationship with God who delivered him from the giant, the Lord that Gave him the whole kingdom. Now, after hearing from Nathan, what did David do? 
I can think of several options of what he could have done. He could bribe the prophet, Nathan, get him to shut up. Or better yet, he could just kill him. I mean, nobody would doubt an execution from the king. Or he could challenge the prophet with pride. Who are you to speak about God, Nathan? The Lord has favor on me. Where were you when Goliath challenged the whole whole entire nation? Was it you that bought him? Where would you be if it wasn't for me? Or he could appease the prophet, you know, satisfy him in the moment, sweep it under the rug, a little lip service. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I, I messed up. I'm really sorry. Would you mind telling God that I learned my lesson? Or he could, he could try to work his way back into God's favor. Servants, give me a thousand bulls and spotless lambs, and we're going to build an altar, and we're going to sacrifice this all to the Lord. We'll sacrifice the animals, and then afterward I'll fast, and then I'll order the entire nation to fast along with me. Surely God will look down upon us with great favor for the exchange I'm making for my sin. But no, David did none of those things. Instead, David repented. He turned away from himself and his sin. He turned entirely towards God, a shift in direction. It's like a a ship on the sea. He changed direction, and now he's headed this way, towards God, away from himself. Look again at Psalm 51. He says, You, God, will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. Talking about an animal sacrifice. Instead, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart in verse 16. That's all he has to offer. There is humility in that. Is there anyone in this room this morning that is genuinely brokenhearted about their sin? about the life that they've lived in rebellion to God's Word. Good. Psalm 51 says, good. You're in the right position now for repentance. Listen to David and all the things he asked for. I broke it down here. Have mercy on me, O God. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me. Cleanse me, teach me, purge me, create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me, cast me not away, take not your Holy Spirit away from me, restore to me the joy of your salvation, uphold me with a willing spirit, deliver me, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. At the heart of David are words of a man that has completely surrendered. but I'm not David, and neither are you. And surrender is not as simple as it might sound, is it? Why? Because the kind of heart posturing, the kind of repentance, like David is saying here, is completely counter-cultural. It goes against the grain of our typical social paradigm. It's like swimming upstream. I know this too well because I had to learn the hard way. The downstream current of culture flows so strongly against godly surrender that I could prove it right here on this stage in this room. I'll do a little experiment and watch how your mind reacts to what I'm about to say, okay? Imagine I pull you aside and I tell you, I am tormented by my past. And my mind keeps playing back what happened over and over and over. That's like David's verse 3. My sin is ever before me. And then I say this. I say, I lost my son, River. He drowned in our pool. And I was there, 20 feet away. I couldn't stop it from happening. I didn't hear him get into the gate. It was me. 
I was responsible for the three kids that night. Now I cannot shake the fact that I am guilty of his death. Because I've lived this, I know in this experiment what you might say. Because this is a true story. Probably something like you'd say, oh, no, 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 Granger. No, no, it's not your fault. You should never feel guilty about this. And that brings me to my first point. What does the world tell us to do with our guilt? Well, it it says things like, that was a long time ago, or it's not that bad, or you need to let it go. Here's a catchy one. Your past doesn't define you. That's what most people would say, and it comes from a, a, a sincerely good place. It's meant for good intentions. But here's the thing. Just because you tell me that I shouldn't feel guilty doesn't make me feel not guilty. Because I am. You weren't the one responsible. You weren't the responsible adult in the backyard that evening. I was. I was the one that held his cold, lifeless body in my arms. See, this kind of death grip that guilt has on a person is tormenting. Do you feel guilty about something today? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Is it because of something you've done or watched or said maybe just once or too many times? Or is it maybe something you didn't do enough? Maybe there is a woman here still struggling with something she did when she was younger and the guilt is haunting her. After all these years, she can't let it go. Maybe there's someone that feels guilt because they weren't there for their grandpa before he died and now it's too late to tell him exactly what he meant to you. Maybe there's a father who has covered himself up in work so much for so long that his kids have now become distant and he thinks the damage might already be done. Maybe there's someone here who struggles with porn or someone who's had an abortion, someone who's had one too many drinks on one too many occasions. If you want to be free of that, Keep listening. For me, in my guilt with River's death, I found a similarity with myself and PTSD-afflicted war veterans. When I was writing my book, Like a River, I remembered a conversation I had with Medal of Honor winner recipient, Dakota Meyer. So he was struggling deeply with guilt. He lost his whole unit in Afghanistan. And he was too late to the battle. He was held up and too late to save them. And everyone told him, Dakota, you can't blame yourself for this. But that didn't change the fact that he still felt overrun with guilt. And so did I. I felt the same way. Now listen, I am not saying that We should go around telling hurting veterans that they are guilty. That's not helpful, not encouraging at all, and that's not my point. I'm simply just trying to illustrate that the world will usually try to convince us that sin or suffering is a problem outside of us, and if we could just manifest a truth within ourselves, then we could overcome it ourselves. On the contrary... The Bible says the problem is us. That's why the gospel isn't about saving us from the world. It's about saving us from ourselves. 
come back to that in a minute. In 2022, I was in a movie called Moonrise. In fact, when I was filming it, I took time during the filming to come here to preach at this church. And my character in that story had a, had a pretty rough go at life. And there's this big emotional climactic scene at the end when I'm, I'm talking with my daughter in the movie and I say, oh, Ellie, how will you ever forgive me? And she says, I have forgiven you, Dad, but you need to forgive you. This is exactly the pattern of our culture. Somehow we live in a world where the ultimate form of healing comes from forgiving ourselves. That's crazy. As if somehow we have the power to forget, cover, wash away, and cleanse our guilt from ourselves by ourselves. As beautiful as that might sound on an Instagram meme, everyone in this room knows that's not possible. What's so encouraging about Psalm 51 is that David does not do that. Instead of trying to forgive himself or making peace with the universe so that he could finally feel guiltless, he comes to God with his guilt. And that brings me to point number two. What does the Bible tell us to do with our guilt? Now, the Christian Standard Bible is a slightly different translation than the ESV that I read earlier, the English Standard Version. The CSB doesn't say the word iniquity like the ESV does. That word iniquity is defined as a misdeed or a sin or something that causes shame or guilt. Yes. The CSB translates it as Guilt, iniquity is now guilt. So it means exactly the same thing, but in light of what I'm talking about, let me read Psalm 51 in the CSB. Verse 2, completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. Verse 5, indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Verse 9, turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt. You see, the Bible tells us we were born guilty while the world tells us, yeah, you're not guilty. But praise God, we have a gospel that says, hey, sinner, turn to me. Give me your guilt and all your shame, and I will completely wash it away and make you clean. Oh, and that, that broken heart you have, give it to me, all of it, and I'll create in you a new one. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. This is good news for God's people. When I was tormented and burdened and at the absolute end of my rope, it wasn't forgiving myself that gave me peace. It wasn't clever little self-help books that gave me joy. It wasn't self-discipline or self-love or self-discovery that gave me rest. In fact, it had nothing to do with myself at all. It was complete surrender to my Lord and Savior Jesus that did that. He is the giver of new hearts. There are three kinds of people I would like to speak with this morning about this. The first group is the Christian. The Christian that is overrun with guilt, who needs to be reminded that they are saved and can rest in the finished work of Christ, not because of what they have done, but what he has done. The second group is the cultural Christian. That's the person that thinks they're a Christian, but their heart is calloused like stone. They need to be told they're not saved. 
They're in grave danger. And here's the scary part. This is the biggest group here this morning. I could recognize you because I was you for most of my life. And the third group is the non-believer who is crushed by guilt and shame, and they need to be told about the Savior, Jesus. To all three groups, I say this. The object of King David's faith in Psalm 51, the reason for his cleansing and renewal and forgiveness and restoration and covering of guilt was paid in full by Jesus' ultimate sacrifice of himself on the cross. David was looking forward to that a thousand years before it happened. He didn't quite know what it was, but his faith was looking forward to that. Today, on this side of the cross, we could look back on that sacrifice with confidence that it is finished. By trusting in Jesus, we too can be washed clean from ourselves. Do you know what, the Jesus, what Jesus said about self? He said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels will save it. And for those that do, he says this, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is the only path to life. If you don't surrender to him, if you don't trust in him, if you don't believe in him, then you will not rest in him or in any other way. He healed me, and he could heal you. He's never denied a shamed, guilty, weary sinner that came to him, and he's not going to start with you. You know, there, there is a beautiful picture of this kind of restoration, this kind of cleansing. There's a beautiful picture of this in the New Testament in Titus chapter 3. Listen to this, Titus 3, verse 4 through 7. When the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, that is Jesus, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That is exactly what David was crying out for in Psalm 51. The gospel was his only hope. And praise God, it's available to you and me. What does the world tell us to do with our guilt? It says, pretend you're not guilty. The past doesn't define you. You need to forgive yourself. What does the Bible tell us to do with our guilt? It says, oh, you were born guilty. No matter how good you think you are, you are in rebellion to our Creator. You aren't seeking after God. You're seeking after yourselves. So the Bible says, repent, turn away from your sin. As Jesus said, deny yourself and come to me to be clean, to be a child of God. It says, believe the good news of the gospel. Christians, when this happens to you, you could rest because your guilt has now been wiped clean. To follow the way of the world is death. To follow the way of Jesus is life. Sometimes I see headlines come out about myself and the clickbait titles make me smile. 
Recently, I saw one titled, The Real Reason Granger Smith is Leaving Touring. And I thought, oh, get to get my popcorn and read this one. This is going to be good. I could save you guys the time and effort from reading a silly entertainment publication, and I could go ahead and tell you the real reason right now. I love music and touring. That's why I've done it for the last 24 years. It's exhilarating to take the stage with my band brothers as the big lights come on and the fog machines and the crowd roars in approval. I love pouring out lyrics one song at a time, night after night, city after city, feeding my never-ending appetite for my hungry ego. It's not because I don't love it. It's also not because I'm burnt out or grieving or unwell or sick or heartbroken. I assure you that although I'm, I'm really busy and I, I haven't slept a whole lot lately, I am more awake and more at peace and more free than any other time in my life. It's not for any of those reasons. Let me tell you the real reason. It's the parable that Jesus used in Matthew 13. It says this. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Knowing Jesus and telling others about him is the treasure of my life. And I want all of you to know this so that you could have him as your treasure too. And I want my family to experience it. And I want my kids to know his joy. I don't want a career based on building a name for myself to get in the way of any of this. No matter what kind of popularity or reputation of any kind of career that I have gained. You know, the Apostle Paul speaks to that. In Philippians chapter 3, he says this, Whatever gain I had, I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. There is not another number one song I could write. There is not another album I could release or sold out concert I can perform that is more important than what I'm telling you right now. I wonder if there's anyone here this morning that's chasing something like I was that's getting in the way of knowing him more. I don't want the Granger Smith name to be famous. Instead, I want to proclaim the name of Christ, the one that washed me clean, the one that has freed me from my shame and guilt, the one that gave me a new heart. I want him to be known, and, and, and I want you to know him, and I want to know him more. That is the real reason I'm leaving touring. From now on, when you hear the name Granger Smith, my goal is, is not for you to say, oh, he was a great country singer, or he was a great entertainer, or he was a great speaker, or author, or he suffered a great loss in his family. Instead of all that, when you hear my name, I want you to say, Granger Smith, I've heard of him. 
Oh, what a great Savior we have in Jesus. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we come to you with nothing to give but a broken heart, a broken spirit. Nothing else is worthy. There is no sacrifice we could give you. You have done it all. You have saved us by grace, through faith, not of our own doing. Lord, let us hear your word. Let us be pierced by it as you have promised. Let us hear the words of your apostle Paul. Let us hear the words of your servant David. Draw yours to you this morning in this room. Stir within someone here this morning. Stir with them with your spirit a feeling, a new feeling. They don't quite know what it is. It's something that feels like the guilt is falling off, the shame is falling off, and they feel a desire to follow, to take up the cross, to come to you, to deny themselves, to forget what the world offers. They know in their heart that the world, what it offers is rubbish. Draw to yourself your own. Let us remember that it's not us, but you that finished this work, you that cleaned, you that restored, healed, and redeemed, and adopted us as sons and daughters. And we rest in that. We pray this as you taught us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship together.